Hello. Welcome to Books and Brews. The place where beer and literature meet. With your host, certified Cicerone, Michael Agnew. And Laura Mosica, author of The Blue Bells Chronicles. Each month we invite a guest author to read their words and talk about writing while sipping beers specially paired with their work. This month's guest is poet Catherine Kaiser. So sit back, pop a cold one, and dive into some books, and brew. Uh, we are in his hands. ready to begin. <laughs> All right, well, welcome to another Books and Brews. Episode number four. With Catherine Books and Brews. Kaiser. Catherine yeah. Kaiser and your hosts, Michael Agnew and... Laura Vosica. Awesome. Yeah, so how's your month been, Michael? Oh, uh, crazy. Uh, prepping for my theater tour. Rehearsals are in full swing. Um, I have a few beer gigs. Uh, oh, you're, are you still girlfriend is home? moving in from Menominee, oh, so it's wow. back and forth, back and uh-huh. forth to Menominee. Uh-huh. Uh, Lots of big stuff crazy. going on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, my month right now, I'm kind of in between events, but my son and I are going to Hawaii to visit his older brother, and so we are looking at taking some scuba lessons so I can do more than, uh, you know, put on a face mask and try not to nice. panic, which is the way I've scuba dived before. It's I, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> But I found out uh, to learn to do a little better than that is kind of a pricey event, especially yes. if you're paying for two people. So we'll see. Awesome. But, yeah. I hit the, sounds like fun. Well, it's a, I've always wanted to scuba dive, and it's the one thing that has really kind of challenged me, let's say. Most <laughs> other things I, I can do if I put my mind to it, but that mm-hmm. has not been easy for me. So, yeah, how's your garden doing? Oh, uh, it's taken off finally. <laughs> um, finally, with all the rain we've We're had. into raspberry season, mm-hmm. so once the raspberry season hits, I pick like a mixing bowl full of raspberries every day for a couple of weeks uh-huh. uh, and end up with half my freezer full of raspberries. Well, that like literally sense. half yeah. my freezer full that, of raspberries. That, that sounds like a good problem. <laughs> it is a good I, problem. I like that problem. But you have to go out every day. Mm-hmm. I can't, al- I, I'm obsessive enough that I can't not go out and pick mm-hmm. them. Uh, mm-hmm. And so you got to go out every day and it, the patch is big enough that it takes like 45 minutes or more. And to are, do. are you trying to completely clear the raspberries each day? Or anything that's ripe, okay, yeah. Anything that's ripe, yeah. I can't let them rot. No, I, I, remember, <laughs> I remember going out. Uh, a friend of mine had, I think hers was a blackberry bush. And mm-hmm. Yeah, we'd go out with a bunch of our kids and pick and pick and pick. And it was just like they were endless. Yeah. Uh, the number of blackberries. How about, how about your reads of the month? Uh, you know, I have been so busy, I have not read anything. Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> this is part of the job description. I know, it is part of the job description, but I have, I have not read anything. <laughs> I'll, I'll forgive you since you're you're in uh, rehearsals and all. Well, I kind of sort of read two things. Um, one, you can talk about one for me. Yeah, this, okay, this is Michael's book officially, so I guess I'm giving you an opinion. There you go, okay. <laughs> sound good. Um, this is kind of a neat book. I got it for review. Um, actually, it's funny. Both of my books I have mixed feelings about. But the positive of this book, it's called Encounters, Moments of Inspiration by Patrick Stull, and it has a beautiful cover. It's photography, so uh, there is not necessarily a lot of reading. And um, the truth is I really, really like a lot of the photography. Um it's, it's beautifully done. He started much later in life. And, for instance, I like some of the pictures of musicians. Big surprise there, right? Mm-hmm. And I'll open this book so all our podcast listeners obviously can see it. Um, <laughs> you, you two will have to give some feedback. One of the things I kind of like is the way he's played with... Uh, he took photography and then did all this editing. And, you know, it's... It's neat images. It doesn't look anything like a human form, obviously, anymore. But he's had fun with it. And I, I like playing with photo editing, so that's kind of cool. Um, what I didn't really care for was all the commentary in the book. And I'm not going to go into why. I just sometimes I think let art speak for itself. Um, I didn't need all the commentaries, so, um, but the pictures are beautiful, and, and as a 
sort of hopeful photographer myself. I mm -hmm. really liked them a lot. So, and then my other book, uh, I have to actually look at the cover, Short Term Memory, showing it off to everyone, Carolina Moon by Nora Roberts. And I picked this up out of a little library. I left my book in their little library. Uh -huh. And so now I've got like at least 100 more readers since last week because they all found my book. I, I know it works like that. Um, so this one too, I liked. Um, it, I had mixed feelings. There were some things I didn't care for. Um, I thought some of the editing could have been better. But I think she's such a huge name mm -hmm. that publishers just crank it out at this point and figure it doesn't matter. People will keep reading. Um, I like the story of, of this woman who has these psychic abilities that she doesn't necessarily want. And so she is seeing and experiencing things and eventually ends up tracking down the killer of uh, her childhood friend. So it was a good story. Um, I thought there were some kind of cliches and stereotypes in the book mm -hmm. that got more and more nagging the farther into it I went. So that's what I didn't care for. But I like the story itself, and she's a good writer, a good storyteller. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, so today we have Catherine Kaiser. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. And how's your month been? Um, it's been kind of crazy. I took a <laughs> wild driving trip um, out to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. I did almost all the driving. What, what part of the East Coast? Uh, well, we went to Montreal via the northern route through Canada, mm -hmm. and it was like driving through the Boundary Waters for right. oh, a beautiful. couple of days in Ontario. It was just mm -hmm. amazing, and very little traffic, and very polite drivers. Oh, um, wow. And then <laughs> spent a couple of days in Montreal with some friends, toured a college with my college-bound kid, and then went down to Vermont and stayed um, there for a week visiting my mom, my sister, and my nephews. And uh, they're in the mountains outside mm -hmm. of Rutland, uh, Vermont, and we went I swimming. I have a friend in Rutland. Hello? Do you? Hello, wow. hello, John Killery. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> I should have gone with her. <laughs> I bet they know each other. It's such I a small I bet they do. I, I need to double check, but I'm positive he's in Rutland. Yeah. Well, we went swimming up at the dam like uh -huh. three times. It was just beautiful, beautiful lake swimming in the mountains. Nice. That's, yeah, that's fantastic. Had a good so time. let me tell our. Um, um, what are we up to? Was it 100 million podcasts, yeah. or were we only out? Uh, I think we were million? at 101 million last okay, time. Okay, so, so no doubt we're up to like 175 million yeah. now. Let me mark that down so we can keep track. Um, so Catherine Kaiser is the author of two books of poetry, Dark Lake and Pretend the World. She also edited Writing Shotgun, Women Write About Their Mothers. She's received fellowships from Banfield Lock Center for the Arts, the Minnesota State Arts Board, National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Anderson Center for Interdisciplinary Studies. Catherine recently served on the Board of Directors for the Association of Writers and Writing Programs and teaches at Anoka Ramsey Community College and the Loft Literary Center and lives with her family in St. Paul. Welcome, Catherine. Welcome. Thank you. First beer. Uh, all right. So uh, just to explain to everybody how this works. Uh, one, we like to just launch into the first reading by our guest. Um, and then uh, how this goes for first-time listeners. Uh, I read the, the pieces that are going to be read on, on the air. And then uh, look for beers to pair to them, just like I would pair beer to food. Uh, give me the, the name of the first poem. It's Escape from Paradise, Iowa. Escape from Paradise, Iowa. So when I read this, I had this image, and I could be completely wrong here about dates or whatever, but I had this image of 1974. I don't know why 74 in particular, but 1974 and kind of grainy, faded, uh, moving a little bit too fast, uh, color, 8mm uh, home movies. <laughs> um, and this kind of young, carefree, no cares kind of couple, um, just various shots of them. Uh, and I needed a, a beer that kind of matched that, or just an everyday beer. Uh, and it's somewhere up north here. Iowa is not quite up north, but somewhere up here. Uh, so I was looking for a beer that's native to up here, and I came up with hams, <laughs> because it doesn't get more native than that. Uh, so just hams, straight up good old hams. All right. That Give that a try. 
Nice big head on the beer. Cheers. Beers. Yeah, that's because yes. I poured pretty aggressively. <laughs> uh, cheers. Cheers. All right, and go ahead and start reading. Escape from Paradise, Iowa. We are afraid of nothing. At the diner, you order a burger, a grilled cheese for me. We tell bad jokes, pour salt on the table. The waitress glares at us, our clothes too tight, my lipstick too red for this small town. This is the summer of anger and beer. We know everything. How each blade of grass turns in the wind, why the sunlight glints off the pool, the shining of streetlights on black pavement, the darkness of the lake at night. At the bar, you say, I am as Nordic as blonde hair, these big bones under the sheet of my skin, a frame for your thoughts. I am the only one smoking. My breath peels into the air like waves. We have nothing in this town. A beat-up Mustang, a few songs on the jukebox, the torn cover of a book you never read. When we get in the car, you pass me another beer. We are scared of these random roads, the small towns passing, the gas tank nearly empty. My head on your shoulder, the eight-track stuck again. We're going to drive this dirt road all the way to Kansas City. Lovely. I think it's the eight-track that makes me think 1974. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so. So what, what year was it? I, I assume it's based on a real experience? No, not no. really. I wrote this, and I, I was 14 in 1974, so I wasn't drinking beer yet. All right. Um, <laughs> So, no, this was a, about when I lived in Kansas, when I lived in Wichita, um, and there was just kind of this <laughs> sense that it was a nowheresville and we wanted to get out. And, and so, you were in college there? I was in graduate school, graduate there, but school. this didn't really happen, but it was kind of evocative of okay. the feelings of how you uh, felt. at that time. So you wanted it to happen, you wanted to be in a car well, escaping. I was also listening to a lot of Bruce Springsteen at the mm. time, so okay. I'd say this was Bruce Springsteen influence. <laughs> just, just that idea that you want to escape, you want to get in the car, you want to go, and yet the future utility of that that you're very mm -hmm. likely not going to escape <laughs> right so i think right. the hams is a perfect match <laughs> yeah so how did you like it really actually <laughs> better than i i had anticipated i mean hams it's like it's yeah. american lager it's it's <laughs> just there <laughs> is, is this what they call a lawnmower beer Oh, yeah, this would be a yeah. great lawnmower beer. Okay. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yard beer, fishing yeah. beer. Yeah, any, yep. any old-time beer, huh? Yeah, it's, so, a, it's a pounder. <laughs> Catherine, tell us a little about your background. Was your house filled with writing poetry literature? Um, yes and no. My mom was an elementary school teacher, and my dad... Uh, was a theologian. He was a minister for a while. Really? He was a, a mm -hmm. college professor for a while. So, yeah, there was a lot of books. There was a lot of books okay. around our house. And um, I actually had really bad allergies when I was a kid and was drugged up oh, no. <laughs> on antihistamines, I'm realizing uh -huh. now. Anyway, I did a lot of reading. I was okay. not sporty or anything. I stayed okay. inside and read books with my cat. So. so you really grew up surrounded by this. What was your parents' reaction when you said, I want to be a poet when I grow up? Um, my mom was like, well, you need something to fall back on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so no, uh, get, the, get that teaching poet. experience. Yeah, so. and that's what you did, right? You, yes, you were yes. obviously a teacher. And did you start off teaching? Um, when I was in graduate school, I was a TA. Okay. So, and then I spent five years in the music business in between getting my graduate degree and then uh, starting oh, at an open What, what were you doing teaching. in music? I did almost everything except Singing being in a band. No, okay. I was uh, kind of behind the scenes. I did record okay. distribution, record sales, okay. band management. Okay, you were in the music business. The business Okay. End. yeah. See, when I hear the music business, I just assume yeah. musician of yeah. some sort. Well, and that's so. why I ultimately got out is that I really did love the music mm -hmm. and didn't love the business part. Mm -hmm. so. I, I can see that. I love yeah. the writing, but I don't love the business part. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, thank goodness for those who do. Tell us a little bit about your personal craft of 
poetry, do you write poems from inspiration? Do you decide what you want to write about and then start, you know, figuring out what form or how to go about it? Do you do a lot of editing and revising? I do a lot more writing in the summer uh, mm -hmm. when I've got more time and then do more revision in the winter uh, when I'm a little bit busier. So often it'll take me a year to complete a poem. Mm -hmm. um, I like to use exercises and triggers to start work, but sometimes mm -hmm. I... Do you try to write every day then? No, no oh, okay. I'm not an everyday writer, okay. so I aspire to that, but I... I freed myself of those shackles many years ago, or I, I should say those expectations. Cause See, I know, I know a lot of people swear by it that <laughs> if you're going to be a writer, you need to sit down and write every single day. Mm -hmm. And I think so. that's that's more true for prose writers, just because mm -hmm. it takes so much more time. Mm -hmm. There's so mm -hmm. many more words to pound out. So, mm -hmm. so I'm curious what kind of uh, exercises and prompts you use to... Um, there's all kinds of stuff on the internet. There's lists of books. Um, you know, you can use anything as a trigger. So, you know, you can say, write a poem about a ham's beer. <laughs> Sit down and write a poem about ham's beer. So, just anything okay. to get you started. One, two, three, go. <laughs> about hams. I'll bring Freestyle. it to you next year. <laughs> no, I, I'm all into traditional, you know, forms. Mm -hmm. um, I like hams. They go great with yams. No. <laughs> um, see, I, I go for the Dr. Seuss mm -hmm. route. So, um, like music or dance, like speech itself, we've had poetry with us since the dawn of mankind. Why do you think that the human spirit <clears throat> is drawn to poetry instead of just saying it? Just, just saying, you know, we well, went on a road trip to Iowa. <laughs> we wanted to escape. <laughs> yeah, I think. Why is poetry different? Well, before in non in cultures where you don't have a written alphabet, where you're not writing things down, everything is memorized, and it's so much easier to remember things if there's a rhythm, if there's rhyme, um, and I think that's how. You know, poetry became very, very ingrained in our mm -hmm. our souls. I mean, really, mm -hmm. this is the essence of storytelling. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I also think that poetry can comfort us. Poetry can express feelings and thoughts and ideas in ways that we can't normally mm -hmm. express things. And so, people do turn to poetry at times um, when they have hard things to say. And and have you ever dug into sort of I don't know the emotional psychological reasons why that is? Why is poetry better suited to something than just saying it. Because there's something, you know, to say, oh, my girlfriend's moving in, I'm stressed out, or oh, my father died and I'm I think you should I'm correct grieving. that right away. No, I'm, not, I'm not stressed about that. It's just the moving back and forth between okay. you and I'm busy. Um, but, but, but a significant life change. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. you can't, you know, there's complex feelings. You can't bundle all of that up mm -hmm. in a two-sentence statement. And so I think uh, poetry be using metaphor and simile and mm -hmm. sound can be evocative and have multiple layers to it. And I um, think that's true, right. Express complexity. Right, right. And it's, it's an interesting question to me. I think it ties in with the music, the rhythm, things like that. So um, I think we are ready to go on to beer number two. All right. And I think we actually have two poems with this. We have two with poems this. with this, yeah. kind of related poems. Yeah. Um, so the first one is Things I Learned from My Grandmother. And what was the second one? German. Ah, yes. So for this, as I was reading the first poem in particular, Things I Learned from My Grandmother, I was picturing kind of a German beer garden uh, with a bunch of older German people sitting in the shade of, of big trees enjoying, you know, Maas Krug's liter mugs of, of beer. And in southern Germany particularly, uh, beer, the generic beer, is a Munich Helles style. Mm -hmm. uh, it's similar to hams. Think of it as the one of the beers that hams descended from. Uh, so it's a golden lager, more flavorful than hams. Um, but, you know, I was picturing these people in lederhosen and, and <laughs> stuff sitting in the in the beer garden drinking a, a Munich Helles. So um, just, just a fun little point, uh, background point. I spent my first five years in Germany. Mm -hmm. So, of course, my parents took and kept for posterity a picture of me at the age of two with the beer bottle crashed in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we, we've been in the beer yes. gardens, we've been around the later hose, and um, there's an interesting story about the pig fest there, but 
um, let's just say five-year-olds believe anything they're told. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll tell that story someday. And, uh, and my family does hail from southern Germany, so oh, it's very a nice. fitting selection. So, which one are you starting with? Why don't we start with things I learned from my grandmother? Mm-hmm. Cheers, by the way. Cheers. Click. Cheers. Click. Wear rubber gloves while washing dishes to keep your hands soft for hand holding. Carry a file, a plastic rain bonnet, and a small packet of tissues in your snap shut purse. Let the men pump the gas. When you aren't sure what to eat for lunch, open the refrigerator and see what falls out. Do not talk about childbirth, romance, or sex until you are too old to be embarrassed by it. Soft cheeks are good for kissing. It is legal to peruse the dictionary when playing Scrabble. Marry a man you can beat at Pinochle. Men's work is outside the home. Women's on the inside. Do not let people know you can speak German. Cooking does not involve spices. Tend the flowers in your garden. Peonies, roses, columbine. When picking raspberries for your small grandchildren, hang an old coffee can with a string attached around your neck to keep both hands free. Read Family Circus for the cute things kids say. Pay attention to what the men in Washington do with your social security. A woman's goodness is judged by the cleanliness of her house. Always say a visit was too short when you say goodbye. Never question the doctor. Leave with grace. Very nice. And the second poem is is German. Related. So this one is about about my grandfather. And no, this is the grandfather and grandmother who were married to each other, not on opposite sides. Yes, side. okay. yes, yes. So this is my which is why my, I really like the two of them going yeah. together. Yeah, my maternal grandmother and grandfather. So and the the grandparents I was closest okay. to. Did you grow up very near in their vicinity? Not no. at all. They oh. lived in Idaho, so okay. we lived oh, around the Midwest. Way. Okay. So, but we'd visit them every summer and pick raspberries. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is German. During the First World War, my great-grandparents burned all the German books except the Bible, which they hid wrapped in canvas in the root cellar. They would not speak German even in hushed tones at home. Grandmothers strove to enunciate each word clearly, to memorize English poems she could tick from her tongue like cards from a dealer's hand. They stopped making strudel, lebkuchen, spetzla, and springala, and instead cooked green beans until blanched pale, casseroles with pronounceable names ending in hot dish, to be served in the Methodist church basement. During the Second World War, there were no concentration camps in Idaho, but Godhelf Wilhelm, or G.W. as he was known, feared when from his dusty tenement farm he (coughs) saw the Japanese and sometimes the Chinese by mistake rounded up. Saved by the color of his skin, if he kept his mouth shut, his head down, the irrigation water turned high every Thursday, church on Sunday, the store on Saturday morning, they could pretend to be safe. But at home, he hid coins in jars beneath the floorboards, on the attic rafters, behind the canned tomatoes in the cupboard. He was ready for another depression, another draft, a war. He was waiting, always alert, ready, knowing he was the little guy, knowing the bankers owned his land, knowing his tongue revealed his origins, knowing politics could change, and he would once again be the one they had to blame to make rest of the country feel safe. (laughs) Very nice. Um, so I just realized I talked about the style of beer that I poured, but I didn't talk about the actual beer. No, I'm not <laughs> so, sure you did with the hams either. Uh, well, hams is hams. Okay, okay, no um, need to talk about. But it, huh? so uh, I would have poured uh, an actual import 
German Munich Helles. But by the time they get here, they're usually in pretty bad shape. They've been horribly mistreated. Mm. Uh, so I went with one from Shells down in New Ulm, Minnesota. 150-plus-year-old uh, German brewery. They do German-style lagers primarily, and they do them really well. And their Fort Road Helles is what I poured today. It's a great example of a Munich Helles. Mm. I, I'm almost liking it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to say, you're not quite back up to the old fudge, you mm. know, but, but bit by bit. So um, I want to back up to the book itself before we dig into the poems. Why the title, Pretend the World? That's the title of the book that this is, mm -hmm. these poems are from. So why that title? What does it mean to you? The title comes from a couple of different places. Um, <clears throat> this poem talked a little bit about pretending to be safe. Mm -hmm. um, and some of what influenced this book was 9-11 and raising small children. Um, and kind of being an adult, you have to pretend that everything's okay mm -hmm. when it's not. You know, right. there's a tornado warning, you go to the basement, and you're like, oh, we just have to be, have <laughs> to pretend we'll be to be fine. safe. Um, so there's yeah. this thread um, of false security uh, that goes through the book. It also um, indicates this idea of the fact that there's a lot of persona poems in the book, and mm -hmm. so there's the author, the speaker, um, is pretending to be all these different characters. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's poems in the book from around the world, uh, from China and Poland and mm -hmm. Denmark. And right places. on your recording, you have quite quite a cast of people reading these various poems. Yes, yes. I got a state arts board grant in 2014 mm -hmm. to record a CD of right. the poems. When, when I first started listening to it in my car, at first I thought, I think her voice is a little different. Did she maybe have a cold recorded in a different place? <laughs> and bit by bit it dawned on me, especially when the man started reading. <laughs> Wait! <laughs> That's quite the cold. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really bad cold. Yeah. Um, tell us about the picture on the front of the book. So the picture on the front of the book um, is a woman reclining, uh, surrounded by some animals and some trees. She has a wolf mask or a coyote mask on her face, and she's pregnant. And this beautiful image comes from Julie Buffalo Head, a fantastic painter who lives in St. Paul. And she granted me permission to use this image, and I'm forever grateful to her. You can see some of her work at the Minneapolis Institute of Art oh, right now. Impressive. She's got a couple really nice pieces in the Native American Women's Art Exhibit mm -hmm. that's up right So there. did you ask her to do this for the book, or it's a picture you came across that you thought would be perfect? She had already done the painting, and I felt like the idea of the mask, the persona, so mm -hmm. uh, persona means uh, <laughs> mask in Greek, right. so I thought the idea of the woman, and the woman pregnant with possibilities, mm -hmm. pregnant with children, pregnant with poems, um, and then the idea of speaking mm -hmm. through the mask fit very well. Mm -hmm. So. You know, when I first saw this image, I'll be honest, I didn't like it. <laughs> it, it kind of, it turned me off. And, um, but hearing your explanation and going deeper into the poems and this theme running through them, I like it. it it's kind of like the beer, it's growing on me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, it was also a feminist act to put a pregnant woman on the cover yeah. of a book as well. You don't often see that kind mm -hmm. of an image on the cover of a book. Mm -hmm. Laura Kosecki, who is in Wisconsin, um, had had a pregnant woman on mm -hmm. the cover of her book that came out a little bit before mine, and I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll do that. Now, what, what is her book about? Is it also It's poetry? also about pregnancy and, and children. Oh, about and pregnancy. Things, so. Actually, I have a book. We just had the launch of my poetry anthology, or I should say Gabriel's Horn, which I run. Um, we just released Startled by Joy, and um, one of the poets, I'm trying to remember her name, Suzanne Swanson, do you know her? Mm -hmm. I figured you did. Yeah. yeah, one of her chapbooks is, what is it called, postpartum poems, something like that? I don't remember. You don't, don't remember. Yeah, she she very kindly gave me two of her poetry books. I'm not sure if she has two or if she has more, but she gave me House of Music and the postpartum poems, which mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, having as many kids as I do. I'm, I'm interested to mm -hmm. see what her poems are about, and um, I should write a book like that. <laughs> Postpartum. Or a big <laughs> memoir, maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> diapers, diapers, and more diapers. That would be my poem. Um, I'm out of those days. Um, so I was going to ask you what are the themes running through the poems, and you've talked about that a little bit, about pretending, about sort of wearing masks. Mm -hmm. um, 
My feeling is, give me your feedback on this, I think there are times we almost need to wear a mask. You know, when there is a tornado, <laughs> you're not going to run to the kids and go, oh my gosh, we're all going to die, even if you're thinking about it. And there, there is kind of a push and pull there. Yes, where yes. Where you want to be honest, but sometimes maybe right now is not the time <laughs> exactly. to say. And I, I think there is an interesting... Um, push and pull in that. But. So that creates some tension. And I always talk about poetry as not necessarily having plots, but having some tension in there. Mm -hmm. and so as you say exactly, sometimes we must do mm -hmm. that. Um, but then that goes back to the idea of poetry expressing complexities, right, and right. saying what we can't say sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, well, I mean, I guess you can do that <clears throat> in prose too with the underlying themes where you don't state it outright, but that gets into a whole different thing. No, you chose to divide this book into three acts, as you call them, instead of saying three sections, part one, part two, whatever. Is there a theme to each act, and how would each act differ from the others? So the three sections, the acts actually go back to this idea of pretending. Okay. Um, and it, you know, it comes from play. theater, mm -hmm. um, of course. And the first section is more domestic, more in the house. The second section um, has some historical poems, has more of the uh, kind of around the world persona poems. Um, and then the third act is, a, is, is there's sort of a resolution to it. We sort of have the denouement, the kind of the mm -hmm. author, the writer, um, the speaker, uh, kind of by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, thinking and that, that was, I, I was just thinking about this as you talked, I was going to ask, do the acts in your book follow an arc as a play would? And it sounds like they do. We tried, yeah. We tried. We tried. And that's, that's a challenge. And I think poetry, books of poetry have changed that people used to just throw all the poems in there. And I think it's more sort of the fashion today to look for themes, to put together a book that follows a theme. Absolutely. And I, I, that's a little more challenging. I kind think of, it is. Kind of like musicians like uh, curating an album. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Right. Kind of, and people want to say, what is this about? So I think in mm -hmm. some ways it's driven by marketing. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think people really like a book about something. Um, mm -hmm. So, for instance, Matt Rasmussen from the Twin Cities has a fantastic book called Black Aperture about his brother's suicide. And he worked on that book for many years and slowly just cut all the other poems that weren't about mm -hmm. that. It, it's a thin small but very very intensely powerful book that won a national award which which raises the question did you start with the idea of these themes or did you write a whole bunch of poems and say oh wait there's a theme no i wrote a whole bunch and okay then, and said then <laughs> just <laughs> found the theme. but you know i think we have questions that we're always seeking answers for mm -hmm. i think there's things that we're thinking about i think mm -hmm. those themes naturally emerge you know in my first book somebody at a reading once said did you know how many dolphins you have in your book and I'm like what <laughs> and dolphins? you didn't even notice I didn't even notice it. you know that's funny because in my writing I, I'm not going to tell you this thing that somebody noticed because it kind of gets into some family stories um, but she pointed this out to me that there was a certain figure entirely lacking in my writing and I went you're right I didn't even notice that mm -hmm. and it's funny that it was happening even in my early 20s when I would not have expected that mm -hmm. and life experience tells me why and I, I don't mean to be vague but you know I'm not gonna get into some of that stuff so about the poems tell us about your grandmother you sound very fond of her in the poem and I love that about it mm -hmm. and yet I'm betting that you don't agree with Plenty of her advice. I mean, well, you you wouldn't give that advice. We're today. Re we're recording in my house, and my guest can tell you it's not totally clean. You know, <laughs> um, you're talking to someone with nine <coughs> kids and a menagerie, uh -huh. so <laughs> looks good. So no, my grandmother was a, a very smart, intelligent woman. She could beat me at um, Scrabble when she was in her early nineties, and I was you know in graduate school for English, and she could still beat me. She was whip smart. She was persnickety. Um, and so, yeah, there was some generational differences there uh, that we, we mm -hmm. worked hard to bridge. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, I really honor the life that she lived as well as a farm wife. And, mm -hmm. you know, she taught in a one-room schoolhouse. She, at one point, was cooking for, you know, like 20 hired hands on the farm, mm -hmm. breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Wow. I mean, you know, what a, what a life. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anyway. So a, lot, a lot harder than our lives in many ways. Like I, I often think of my grandmother and how hard she worked. 
Um, I mean, even to laundry, you know, wringing out the stuff by hand. Mm -hmm. um, don't know how she did it. Um, would you say her advice is good, bad, a mix? Um, I would say it's a portrait. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a portrait of mm -hmm. her. So, um, you know, I always question the doctor. I don't leave gracefully, so no, that's, <laughs> that's not me at all. I think, I think it's a portrait of the time, too. Yes. yes. There is, and I think part of what I like about it is that even though there are things in there many people would not agree with today, possibly most people would not agree with today, they can look at that and see the beauty of who she was and the strength of who she was. You can see her intelligence in that poem and how, okay, maybe she's talking about, you know, keep your cheeks soft for kissing, and then she turns right around and says, and don't take your eye off those politicians. Mm -hmm. You know, she can look nice and gentle and feminine, but she's nobody's fool. And, you know, that's, that's a beautiful thing, too. So if you had a granddaughter and you wrote a poem to her, what advice would you give? Mm. Well, I'm really concerned about climate change, so I'd say go move to Canada. Okay. <laughs> Both of my kids are looking at colleges in Canada right now. Um, what advice would I give? I think flexibility. I think the world is changing faster and faster. Um, flexibility, maybe even some survival skills. You know, we took our kids camping when they were little. Mm -hmm. um, learning how to read people and be honest and uh, be in touch with your feelings. So if this book is about safety and danger, we almost always know when we're in danger, but we sometimes don't pay attention to those mm -hmm. right. cues. So Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Um, and sometimes we just don't know what to do about it, mm -hmm. no matter how much we say. I, I think sometimes we pretend we're not because if we admit we are, so my grandmother was You're very have to do something. My grandmother was bound by sort of those external social rules, which mm -hmm. as an immigrant, she was trying so hard to learn to fit in. Um, and I guess my advice would be listen to yourself rather than those external rules. Mm -hmm. And I think working with these two poems together, that idea of trying so hard to fit in plays into the second poem by your mm -hmm. grandfather in a way that trying so hard to fit in in a for self-protection. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I really like that, and I think that's a great poem. We don't talk a lot about the German experience of German Americans during World War II, but I really relate to that because my family also has strong German heritage. They're from central Minnesota. In fact, my grandmother is from Freeport, which, uh, anybody who's listened to Lake Wobegon, they believe that it's based on Freeport. Mm. And some of my relatives and ancestors actually owned what, is, is it called Chatterbox Cafe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So really? I, yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, they're distant relatives. I don't know them personally. Um, they wouldn't give me a free meal if I walked in or anything, but it's kind of cool to, to realize, oh wow, there's a big family connection, but they have a similar story where many of my great aunts and uncles grew up speaking German, or my mother's cousins, and they did decide, you know, we, we need to quit speaking German. So, and it's kind of sad because... You know, it's. I, I wish I'd grown up bilingual, but I think it's, it's important. Not to be. Important now, as we're talking about immigration <coughs> as a country, to kind of be looking at the fact that most of the people in this country are immigrants mm -hmm. and have, you know, been discriminated against, and we need to kind of think about what was that and how can that change our actions to other yeah. people at this. Family time. histories are fascinating. I mean, I know people who, on one side, they go back to the daughters of the American Revolution; on the other side, their first generation. So, I mean, my own kids are, I, I suppose, what does first generation mean? Like, they're the first born in this country? Yeah. Yeah, on their dad's side, they're first generation. On my side, they go back to maybe 1840s on some sides, but anyway. Um, I think we are on to beer number three. All right, so this is going, we're going to listen to this poem from the CD. Uh, and this is track number seven on the CD, Returning to Lake Superior. Uh, with this beer, 
this is from Bad Weather Brewing There's in no St. Label. Paul. There's no label because wow. I went to the brewery and had them fill that for me specifically. Really? <laughs> I had to ask to get that beer. <laughs> why, why is it that hard to get? Uh, because it's a taproom only thing and at the brewery they only sell growlers which are okay. 64 ounces and I certainly didn't need 64 ounces well, of the beer. Well speak for yourself. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I asked, I I asked the brewer if it would be possible for me to get a smaller portion um, and did, Andy did was kind enough to... A reason why? Oh I told him it oh, was okay. going to be in a podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So with this poem what I was taking from it was a walk in the woods along Lake Superior at night, a dark woods, um, and kind of even though it's a, an impenetrable dark in my own mind, it's just full of life all around. Uh, and then, you know, it's cold up there on the shore of Lake Superior. Even in the summer it can be cold at night. Uh, and so I was picturing a little campfire, not a big bonfire or anything, mm -hmm. just a small campfire. So I was looking for a beer that was dark, impenetrably dark, uh, but I also wanted a little bit of something to hint at that campfire. So this is a smoked porter. Uh, it is uh, smoked, the malt is smoked with both beech wood and cherry wood. Uh, both of those give a different kind of smoke flavor. The beech wood gives kind of a meaty, fatty smoke flavor, and the cherry wood gives what I would call char. Uh, it's sharper. Um, so you get the black, you get the impenetrably dark, you get the smoke from the campfire, uh, you get roasty notes from the malt, and it all just kind of blends together. Um, and I was smooth, definitely warming taste this just on those words alone. It was like poetry. <laughs> wait, wait, we didn't, you know, click and cheers. Okay. <laughs> it is so dark. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. I've got this cough. <laughs> yes, um, it is. They call this beer Ring of Fire uh, at Bad Weather, and I'm not sure if it That's would still be available. Um, I like it's that. It's a tap room only, so it was a short-lived beer. Uh, so it might not still be there. Well, that's a shame, but when when did you pick this up? Uh, oh, this is a while back. Oh, okay, so you've had this a while. Yeah. Okay, okay. Not long enough for it to go bad, for anyone who wants to know. <laughs> <laughs> long, but not that long. All right, so we are now going to hear Lake Superior is the name of the poem, right? Returning to Lake Superior. Returning yeah. to Lake Superior, sorry. And is it on the album? Yes. It's based on Pretend the World. So it's, it's on, in, it's on in the CD, the yep. Go ahead. Returning to Lake Superior. In late August, stomp on the path through matted grass. The dark woods. Run on the shore and make all the stars sing. There isn't a bud or berry changing, moving, glistening. Out in the open again, hear the harp of darkness sing. Damp air caresses your face, strokes your snow-white feathers. Crimson curls a leaf sedge. Deer crosses the road in the fog behind you.
earth reminds you, we are all learning to leave. Beautiful. I love the music behind it. I, I've heard Rosie Peters in particular do this with a musician behind the mm-hmm. poetry, and I just I love the effect. Um, she does it very well. You do it beautifully in this. I think one of the really interesting ones, I was torn between which <coughs> one to pick. I also really like the clarinet. Is it a clarinet or an alto? It's or? a clarinet. This is guitarist Glenn Helgeson right. here, mm-hmm. and then I also work with clarinet, mm-hmm. clarinetist Sean Egan. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that's so interesting because nobody puts a clarinet behind poetry. I mean, that's almost almost like putting a trombone or a tuba behind poetry. <laughs> yeah, with well, the right poem, I mean... <laughs> I, well, I'm taking that as a challenge. Uh-huh. I'm going to write the right poem for a tuba, tuba accompaniment. Um, so what, what inspired you? Did you hear other people do it? Or who, who do you... Have you heard that you really like? Well, I've been working this. with musicians... Mm-hmm since I was in graduate school, Mm -hmm. I really like the idea of bringing poetry off the page Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people are like, ooh, poetry. They had this bad experience in junior Mm -hmm. high. Um, And so I think through collaboration that often we can bring poetry to new audiences. And I love working with people in other genres. So Sean Egan, the clarinetist that you mentioned, I started working with him in 2011 when I first started reading with Pretend the World. Mm -hmm. And we ended up uh, creating a band. So we now have the Sonoglyph Collective, (laughs) which is three musicians and four writers. And we perform around the Twin Cities. We've got two gigs coming up in August. And uh, we read and perform poetry, and then we have drums, and we have bass, and we Mm -hmm. have the clarinet Mm -hmm. behind us, too. And uh, most of the musicians are trained in jazz, um, Mm -hmm. so we kind of focus on improvisation. Um, But it's really fun to explore kind of this intersection of where the word and music can meet. So that was something I was curious about listening to this. Uh, To what extent... The music is improvised versus scored. I think it was all pretty much improvised. Mm So there, uh, on the CD, there's a couple of singers that actually wrote music to go with the poems, but the book came first, and then Mm -hmm. the music kind of came after that. So, so what what is your input? Do you just say, "Here's the poem, do whatever," or do you tell them, "I'd like such and such a feeling"? Do you choose the instrument? Do they sort of pick what poem they think their instrument would work with? Well, in the case of the CD, the book was already published and so I sent the book to people mm-hmm. and said here um, and so we kind of created the okay. music to go with the existing poems. Mm-hmm. I also had an art exhibit when the book came out um, and s- of artwork that was inspired by the book that mm-hmm. was really fun um, but with Sonoglyph Collective we often sometimes we write for performance and so those pieces will be a little bit different than writing for the page. They'll have more repetition maybe more sound play. Mm-hmm. They'll often be longer. Uh, there'll be more spaces uh, just for the music to kind of come up um, mm-hmm. and become part of the work. Yeah, um, I just I, I really do like that. I, I'm amazed by how well the clarinet works. And like I said, I was really torn which piece to pick. I think I ended up picking this one because, like Superior, <laughs> need I say more? Mm-hmm. Anyone in Minnesota, I think, really really loves Lake Superior. Um, my first sight of it was I was short of my 12th birthday, and we moved from Virginia. My dad was in the Air Force, so we moved from Virginia up to his new post at UMD where he was running the ROTC program. And instead of just driving across the country, we drove up the East Coast across Canada. We stopped at Gettysburg, various places along the way, and drove in through Sault Ste. Marie. And, you know, it's just, it's an amazing sight when you've never seen a lake that Mm -hmm. size. And my school bus used to go up the road overlooking it every morning. It it was fantastic. So you obviously love it, too. What is your background with Superior? Well, I just just love northern Minnesota very much. I love camping and hiking and walking and just being next to it. Did your parents bring you up there? Is it something you discovered as an adult? I went to the BWCA as a kid, but yes, I think... Lake Superior has been more my adult mm-hmm. connection. Okay. I just get a great feeling being close yeah. to all that water and mm-hmm. the pounding mm-hmm. waves and the mm-hmm. rocks. And I, I actually 
almost kind of sort of well I really did kind of have the opportunity to buy the Palisades in by Ted Gooch with a friend and uh, that would have been incredible wow. to, to have lived there so anyway how do you think the addition of music changes the experience of the poem and do you think there are some poems that shouldn't be paired with music well certainly there would be some poems that are going to be more powerful just mm -hmm. presented as the words themselves mm -hmm. um, I think it changes in that as I just said you need to leave some space for the music mm -hmm. so as you heard in this piece I would pause mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. more within the poem just mm -hmm. to let the music kind of rise up and it's kind of like so you were talking about the musicians were were trained in jazz the way you read the poem with those pauses it's almost like a, a jazz singer's phrasing yeah, so the poem becomes, as you say, another instrument yeah. in some it really ways. Does. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a different process. It's a different way to present work. Um, but I think it's more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always thought with Sonoglyph Collective, we're doing this strange thing, and yet people keep coming back. They keep liking it. <laughs> so I guess we're doing something okay. Well, I, I think it's different. It's unique. And I personally think it's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I find more power to it, and yet I think it would lose that if everybody did it. I think it's something that you need maybe a bit of a light touch, mm -hmm. that some poetry uses it to keep it unique and fresh and beautiful. And historically, across cultures, across time, poems have often been accompanied mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. an instrument, mm -hmm. so right. there's a connection uh, there. That's the basis of drama, the founding of drama, yeah. is poems accompanied by music. I yeah, think. yeah. Um, we have had a huge, huge change in technology in the last 15 years that pretty much allows anybody to publish anything. And it used to be the joke that a, a publisher would rather see a thief in their office than a poet. <laughs> um, I believe I heard that at the Minnesota Book Awards, of all places. So how has this ability for anyone to publish anything changed the world of poetry, the access to it, people's enjoyment of it. Well, I think it's made it all much more democratic. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to the 1980s with the music becoming, um, with the coming of zines, so people mm -hmm. were publishing their own chapbooks and their own zines and their own magazines. Actually, if we look back to the 1970s, the basis of a lot of the presses we have here in the Twin Cities, Toothpaste Press became Coffee House Press, mm -hmm. Grey Wolf Press, um, milkweed editions. These were all small kind of indie presses mm -hmm. that have now become more established. So I think as we've seen technology change with the internet now, um, yeah, and people can post poems on Instagram. They can post themselves reading poems on YouTube. I think it's really opened poetry up. We have a whole mm -hmm. new generation of students uh, I speak as a college teacher that are interested in poetry now, and so that's great. So they come, you know, they may come to my poetry writing class because they like Instagram poems, and I'll say, well, wonderful, let's start there, let's move on to mm -hmm. some other things. Um, but I think it's allowing for more people to express themselves. Yes. It's more democratic, it's more open, it's more equitable. Um, I think we have to be careful not to judge you know, and say, you know, published written poetry is better than spoken word mm -hmm. poetry. There's a lot of poets going back and forth um, mm -hmm. between those genres. I think of our local writers, Ed Bakley, Bao Fee, um, some people that came up through the spoken word, mm -hmm. uh, Denez Smith, um, and are now publishing some of our best books. So, and, and I think, too, it's somewhat about the ability of the poet themselves, not necessarily the style. You know, there is some spoken word I really like, there's some I don't. There is some classical forms, poetry in classical forms I really like, there are some I don't. Uh, free form, same thing. There is some that I think is really, really good, some I don't care for. So, you know, it's, um, but I, I do think that it's really opened the world up, and I think my own interest in poetry has really just exponentially increased because it's so available. Whereas before, I could look at a shelf full of poets and, well, you know, what am I going to do with that? Um, there's so much to choose from, but now you can just go on a site and you can read a few here, a few there, you can develop your tastes. Um, on the other hand, yeah, some, <laughs> some things go out, and I've, everybody has said this about indie publishing, <coughs> things go out that maybe required a little more editing, you know, that's, that's the downside. But what do you see as the future of poetry? Well, hopefully all these different strands, whether it's performance poetry, where we've got that intersection of theater um, and, uh, and in spoken word, 
um, that kind of came up through the poetry slams, and you know we've got these shorter poems that are almost being presented as images. Mm -hmm. um, we've got their written word. I hope mm -hmm. it all continues. Yeah, um, I especially <coughs> like art paired with poetry too. That's I'm I'm currently just finishing up formatting a book that Gabriel Sorn will be publishing. It is called. Um, <laughs> I should have written this down. Short term memory. <laughs> help, help me. It's called Gypsy Heart. Gypsy Heart. The poems of Lily Gell. It's fascinating because it's poems written by a woman who moved here in her twenties for an arranged marriage from Hungary, and so her granddaughter has compiled these poems that she left and translated them. It's um, and she's put clip art with all of them. It's I, I like the art she's picked. So I think we are about ready to wrap up. We are about ready to wrap up. And where can we find you, Catherine? Um, well, I'll be performing with the Sonoglyph Collective on <clears throat> July uh, 27th at Greenway Glow along the Greenway in Minneapolis from 6.30 to 9 o'clock. I think we'll be performing off and on and offering people an opportunity to write and perform their own poems mm -hmm. there. Um, Sonoglyph will be at the Irish Festival at noon on August 10th. Um, in St. Paul, and then I'll also be performing uh, with Marie Cooney and some other people, with mu a mu musician, Kevin Kern, who's written music to go with my poetry, and that'll be as part of the Fringe Fest, and that's 5.30 p.m. August 10th at Augsburg College. So, And you can get that all up on your website. Where yes. can we find you uh, online or social media? I'm on Twitter. Um, at Dark Lake, um, and I'm on Facebook as well as Catherine Kaiser. All right, and Michael, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me at my website, aperfectpint.net, and on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as A Perfect Pint. Very nice, and I am at many places. I'm at bluebellschronicles.com. You can also find that through lauravosika.com if you can spell Vosika. <laughs> and V-O-S-I-K-A. Um, I'm on Twitter, Facebook. Um, I've been dragged onto Instagram. <laughs> uh, all of those are basically under my name, and um, there is another Laura Vosika in this world. Really? But yeah, yeah, that shocked me. Um, so my upcoming events on August August 11th at the Egg Roll Queen Cafe, 5.30 to 7.30. There will be a reading, an open mic, that is for the poets and startled by Joy, the new poetry anthology. That is at, well, it'll be on our site, 1579 Hamlin Avenue in Falcon Heights, uh, which is St. Paul. And then October 6th, some of those poets will also be reading at the Troubadour Wine Bar, 5.30 to about 7, 7.30, and there's an open mic following uh, those poets at the Troubadour will only read for maybe 30 minutes among us, and then there will be an open mic. So, do you have upcoming events? Uh, this will already have happened by the time this goes on, and nobody can... I'm not going to be performing anyway, but I will be judging the Beer and Bacon Classic this weekend. <laughs> beer, beer and Bacon or Beer and Bacon? Beer and Bacon. I like it's a that. feast of bacon I dishes like and, and beer. There's um, nothing better than Then in that August, thing. I'll be on tour with my theater troupe, GTC Dramatic Dialogues, uh, touring colleges all over the country, which, of course... Nobody can go see these either. <laughs> but, but we will hear all about you it. You will hear all about it. So You can next, find uh, us, us at uh, booksandbrews.net and on Instagram as book n brews. Book, singular, the letter N, brews. More brews than book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that works. Well, we did have two books today. So next month, uh, we have a poet from the anthology, Startled by Joy. He goes by the name of Tekken. He is a poet, and I said that, an author of a series of about a dozen books of poetry titled Everyday Mind. Just as a side note, they have beautiful covers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, talk about poetry and art. I want to read those books just because the covers are beautiful. So, Tekken is the Dharma name for Barry McDonald. He has lived in England, Japan, and Minnesota, which makes me want to say uh, the old Sesame Street thing, which one of these things is not like the other? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, all of which have influenced him. Um, 
what does that mean? Snow? His yeah. poems are about snow. <laughs> no, I, I'm looking forward to reading his poems and hearing them. The themes of his life revolve around his Buddhist practice and his recovery from addiction. His books, Everyday Mind, look for the extraordinary hidden within everyday events. He uses the sonnet form without the rhyme scheme, followed by a Japanese tanka. That's Great. coming up next month. So. so, Catherine, thanks for uh, sitting here with us and Thank you chatting and so reading. Thank you so much. It was delicious. Thank you, <laughs> Laura, for hosting. Thank you, Michael, for bringing the beer. <laughs> and this has been episode four of the Books and Brews podcast. With Catherine Kaiser.